two predictions. One of them, and this one, he didn't want. Because when he started doing his calculations, what he expected to be able to show was that these hot, dense conditions of the early universe cooked up all of the chemical elements. But whenever he did his calculations, it, it wouldn't work. The only thing you could get out of the early universe was hydrogen and helium. He thought that was wrong. He also made this prediction, which is the most famous prediction. His physics told him that if the universe at one time had been too hot for atoms to exist, and in the expansion it cooled so that at some point atoms could be formed, electrons could combine with positively charged nuclei to form neutral atoms, that every single photon in the universe at that time had to still be in the universe today. Because these photons are electromagnetic radiation. They interact with matter by interacting with their charge. When the matter went from being nuclei and electrons to being neutral atoms, the photons stopped interacting. It was as if all the matter had disappeared. And where are those photons going to go? They filled up the universe then, they have to fill up the universe today. But George Germain realized, though, that although the temperature of that radiation, the temperature of that photon distribution was around 3,000 degrees, that is the temperature at which atoms can finally form, that the expansion of space would gradually cool that temperature. And he calculated that the temperature of that radiation today is probably only a few degrees above absolute zero. So he didn't like this prediction either because he thought it was non-falsified. There was no way to determine whether or not it existed. And if you can't determine whether or not the cosmic background radiation exists, then it's not a very useful prediction. He played it very smart, though. He didn't make a big deal out of it because he knew it couldn't be a big deal if it couldn't be tested. Same time, he wanted to get credit for it because later it turned out to be true. So he published it. Galileo did the same thing. It's a very old scientific tradition, actually. So he published it in a place where he knew none of his colleagues would read it. <laughs> for publishing a non testable prediction. But at the same time, he could always go back later and say, look, look at this 1950 publication. There it is. Well, it turned out to be true. Uh, the first one uh, became clear around 1957 when it was realized that heavy elements aren't made in a hot, dense early universe. They're actually made in stars. That is, the conditions in the interior of the stars would mimic the conditions of the early universe with the important exception that instead of it expanding and cooling so that after just a minute it got too cool to happen, it would hold this material together for millions and millions of years to cook up these heavier elements. So that one was turned out to be true. This one also turned out to be true. Uh, it was discovered accidentally. People had no idea what they had discovered. They had a radio telescope, and everywhere they pointed it, they got a signal. It just doesn't make any sense. <coughs> this radiation is not coming from any object because it doesn't matter where we point it. We point it at empty space, we still get the signal. So what they concluded was that the signal must be generated in the machine itself, in the telescope itself. And their first guess was that the uh, company that supplied their uh, equipment had not met the specifications. They argued with them for a while, finally they threw it out, built another, still get the same thing. They thought maybe the pigeons that were living in there were the problem. <laughs> Shipped them out, pigeons came back. A few days later, so they were gotten rid of more permanently. Um, they even went so far, and they described this in the article they finally published, is to climb into the horn of the telescope itself and remove the white out electric material left behind by the pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is, a, this is a story I take about 20 minutes telling in class, I'm going to tell about 30 seconds. But it turns out that someone other than Gamal had also realized that the cosmic background radiation must exist, a fellow at Princeton. And he went to his colleagues, his experimental buddies, and said, is this radiation, if it exists, detectable? 
said, well, that's, we don't know. Let us think about it. They came back and said, a very, very, very difficult experiment, but we can do it. We can do it. The lady, they're going to win the Nobel Prize in Physics. Either they <coughs> discover the radiation and get the Nobel Prize in Physics, or they show that the radiation doesn't exist and get the Nobel Prize in Physics. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to be in that situation? Unfortunately for them, the word leaked out too soon, and it got to Arnold Pence. And he called Robert Dickey to Princeton and said, we've got this problem with our radio telescope. We've got this noise that we can't make go away. Fact, his exact words, a very famous quote. Uh, he turned to his colleagues and said, boys, we've been scooped. Exactly what happened. Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic background radiation that the Princeton group was trying to find. And who gets the Nobel Prize in physics? Nobel laureate? Nobel laureate. <laughs> the Princeton group was just out of luck. Uh, who was also out of luck, but should not have been, was George O'Malley. He should have gotten the Nobel Prize. The Travis did, and he did. The latest instrument to image the cosmic background radiation. Remember, this cosmic background radiation is photons, so you can take pictures of it. You just don't use what you normally take pictures. So this instrument went up into space and began taking pictures of cosmic background radiation. And the data that resulted from those pictures was just really incredible. Uh, the age of the universe. The last slide I'm going to show you is on the contents of the universe. Remarkable. Remarkable. Just by imaging this cosmic background radiation. We can, learn, we can learn and understand almost everything about the present universe and almost everything about the universe at the time the cosmic background radiation was emitted. That is, when the atoms actually formed, which was some 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe. I apologize for rushing, but I need, we need to get finished. This is the picture. So this is the five-year data here. It shows the temperature fluctuation in the cosmic background radiation. And to give you a bit of a feel for what this means, this is a similar diagram that shows the temperature fluctuations of the Earth. The red indicates the hottest near the equator. And as you go towards the blue, it indicates cooler. The average temperature on Earth plans a range of about 100 degrees centigrade. <coughs> this illustrates that variation in fluctuation. This illustrates the variation in fluctuation <coughs> of the temperature of the cosmic background. We look at the range. So the average temperature of the cosmic background <coughs> radiation is this value. The fluctuation about that value is about two parts in 10,000. It's remarkably small, but it's very sensitive. W map, actually, this is the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe. Wilkinson was one of the people at Princeton. 